Nadine Stanton, CEO of Professional Training UK. Welcome to Shaping Your Success and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Uh, it's great having you along because we've done a bit of work before uh, in the last 12 months and um, we've all found you just incredibly dynamic and curious and passionate. I'm hoping that in this conversation we can convey and capture some of that because I think what you you know what you've been doing lately in terms of training people in the last 10, 12 years and the areas that you're focusing on, um, I think people are really opening up to now in their minds. So maybe just start there by asking a little bit about you, your background. I know you were a lawyer for eight years or 10 years before starting your training business. If you wouldn't mind just speaking about that for a couple of minutes, that would be great, a good place to start. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So, um, yeah, I've been, uh, my, I started off my career uh, as a lawyer, um, doing corporate M&A, private equity type stuff for a number of years. So um, that was really interesting. Um, and I found what I really enjoyed about that was actually the development side of the people more than the paperwork. And I think that's probably what got me into training in the first place. So I moved into training from there. Um, and I worked for a couple of uh, organisations, the University of Law and BPP. At BPP, I was head of training, so I used to sort of teach all the young lawyers who were coming in to, to try, try and teach. Um, so we, we, we ran all those programmes and the conferences and all that kind of stuff. So I was head of training and had a team of 32, I think it was. And then 12 years ago, I set up Professional Training UK Limited. Um, and I was on a bit of a mission uh, and the mission was to change this whole idea of tick box training coming along, you know, the whole with the CPD people used to sign in and then clear off. Um, so I was on a mission to make it so that they didn't feel that they wanted to leave. And I, I sort of positioned the company that I've got with aligned with almost the, the idea of being a lawyer is lawyers, whether you're a property lawyer, a litigation lawyer, you solve people's problems. And I wanted training to do exactly the same. So, you know, all, all the stuff we have at professional training is all around the sort of soft skills. We don't train on substantive law. It's all the areas surrounding being a lawyer. So every session that the whole of my team run now, and they're all experienced coaches and trainers and have got a legal background. So that gives them the sort of why or well, we've kind of been you, which I think is quite important. Um, but we, we sort of start every session with not just a here's the topic, but here's the topic. And first of all, what is it you actually want to know? You know, what, what do you struggle with? So we start with that. And then right at the end, and it's very much about the behaviour change after the training session. It's about what are you actually going to do? And that model allows us to really get under the skin of those delegates and find out what their issues are to be able to help them. Because a generic training course with a generic set of slides and a generic set of sort of, you know, exercises, we can all go to, but we try to get those people engaged, whether it's on Zoom or whether it's in the room. So that's kind of where I've ended up where I am today. And actually somebody said to me the other day, what, what's your role? And you called me chief operating uh, or ch chief executive officer. And actually I think I'm chief energy officer. So I, I try and pump a bit of energy into people to feel committed to go and, and, and do this stuff. So, yeah, we're really enjoying it. Why should lawyers, solicitors be focusing on, on, on these skills? What are the benefits above and beyond retaining talented people in your team? I think people that are drawn to our profession, they have naturally and fundamentally a love of learning. And I think because they've got that love of learning, we also crave development in ourselves and it's actually quite personally satisfying when you get that light bulb moment or you get that oh, I'm doing that and I shouldn't be doing that or I need to do more of that because that's working and I think that in terms of job satisfaction really really helps because yes it's it, lawyers go into the profession because they want to help clients they want to do the right thing by people they want to solve problems but as part of that you know you don't want to get to a hedge almost in terms of your own development what we try and do with training is say look there's all these fields out there that you could be looking at and working on and doing and I think to, to most of us crave feedback on ourselves you know you don't get that normally on a zoom call a team's call working with a client 
So to have that, either an outsider looking in or to have those own insights or to spot those blind spots that we all have about ourselves, I think is really, really quite empowering and is quite motivating. And I think people that are attracted to the law, for example, as a profession, they like to be challenged and they like to keep moving and pressing and so on. And, you know, I mean, I'm in my 50s now and as a CEO and having done all these training courses for 20 odd years, you'd think, wouldn't you, I've been on every time management, assertiveness, strategy sessions. I've, I've done them all. There's 50 odd sessions, every single one in some guys or another. But nearly every time I work with the team, I learn something new or I think, oh, what a good way to put it. That is brilliant. Love that. So there was a, a gentleman that I was working with this morning. I won't say his name. And I'm just going to have a look at my notes because I wrote it down. I loved it. And I said, oh, what, what do you get when you work with someone who is like a coach or, a, a, you know, an external? And he said, unpolluted perspective. <laughs> I really like that. And, and that's what you're able to bring. And that, for me, with all the hats that I wear as a chief exec, when you see someone facilitating it really well, it's that unpolluted, you know, it's not, it's not your wife telling you what to do or your boss telling you what to do or your mate who works in the same department. It's someone who's not got that bias, who can sort of, and who sees all these different people and what works and what doesn't work. I think that of itself is quite powerful. And that's for me where the magic happens. Um, well, you know, it's lovely you should, you should mention that because one of the, uh, the key ideas behind shaping your success which, and inviting interesting, thought-provoking speakers like you is that we want lawyers to think and act as entrepreneurial enablers. Yeah. And um, you can't show that sort of leadership that you're talking about, even leading oneself, much less leading a team, if you don't have some of those bits that you're talking around there, which are the occasional bit of objectivity, a critical friend, yeah. an open mind, the ability to self-reflect, yeah. and, and all those things. And so my next question to you be, and, and again, I hope this doesn't sound loaded in any way, because I don't mean it. <laughs> oh, God. One of the things, one of the things that perhaps we observe in the, the training team at the society, the CPD team at the society, is that sometimes those people who need training the most think they need it the least. I, I wonder, is there sometimes, we've already agreed that most listeners are becoming more and more open-minded and more yeah. open to this sort of thing. Yeah. But is there something inherent in the profession that makes people slightly, we're not suggesting, as you've said, that you come to a training session as a golden bullet and you can manage every difficult conversation. But I think what you're saying, if I may paraphrase, is if you go away with just two or three things that really yeah. resonate, that is worthwhile. Yeah. And, and, and so you can understand that there's a certain amount of cynicism from lawyers and lots of other professions around training. I, re, I do get it. So as someone, someone who gets bored easily, this is me, bored easily, impatient, quite bright, likes to be challenged. Most things I'm thinking, this is a complete and utter waste of time. I've got chargeable hours to hit. I've got things to do. To me, those particular delegates are all the more of a challenge to make sure and ensure that when they finish that session, they do have a couple of, it doesn't have to be 52, but a couple of valuable points that they think that was a good use of my time. I'm glad I turned up because, you know, you've got to respect that. These are really hugely busy people. I've got loads of time to do loads of training. Well, least of all being told stuff they already know. And some of them are pretty good at managing a difficult conversation, are pretty good at being assertive. So you've got to make sure you're trying to push it all the time. What's the next field? We've got to the hedge. What can the so that's when you have to have that coaching approach and be flexible because it's not it getting to know these individuals really quickly. But to really be able to respond to that audience in situ and make them think, lawyers want to be challenged in the right way, not so they feel so put on the spot, but so that they start to. You know, I went to something at the Law Society, um, I think it was last Thursday, and this particular lady was excellent. And she just said, she asked a question, you could see almost like the brain in the audience ticking because she said this question, she said, and do you know why people come to work for you? Now, I actually, I'm, I'm quite switched on with that sort of thought, so, well, so I thought anyway. And I'm sat in the audience thinking, actually, I don't know why my team come and work for me. Not, re not really. 
And she was talking about personal branding and this whole thing you're saying, Jim, about this being an entrepreneurial lawyer. But these sorts of key questions, you throw them out to, to teams of lawyers and get them thinking. You get some tremendous answers back. And I think so long as they can start to see that there's a value in it for them to be there, sat there on the Zoom, in the room, whatever it is, then you do get the engagement. So we, we've we obviously spoken and speak fairly regularly, but we haven't spoken particularly about this interview much. From your perspective and your observations, and I hear I think one of the things you're saying there is that, you know, people have to be very mindful of not having the attitude, right, I've reached a fixed point where I've got that cracked. You should always be thinking, how can I understand something a bit more? How can I engage with it a bit more? Even those areas where I've got strength. Yep. What are the what are what are the, the two or three barriers or challenges that you see that people put in front of themselves when it comes to unlocking their full potentials by engaging sometimes with some of these? We've all met and seen great lawyers who are fantastic around statute books, <laughs> black letter law, but maybe don't have a great personal manner and can't bring people with them as a leader or what have you. Yeah. So what, what what are the universal things that you see where you think that's that that's a barrier that, that, that lawyers need to be, you know, I'd, I'd love to see the profession jump over. But, I mean, this is not just lawyers, but this is people generally. And I suppose what I've done for a living is study people, which is quite interesting and fascinating. But I think what most of us put in front of ourselves, if you like, is it's comfort zones. So, you know, you get to whatever level in, in a profession, you're good at what you do, clients come to you because you're known for what you're doing, you know which statute to look up, you know it's section one, two, three, four, five, six, you know how to handle certain things. And you, you develop, and we all do it, like a modus operandi, this is how I operate. Now, to then start to look at areas of your, what you bring to the party outside of that, it requires almost a getting worse before you get better because you're starting to explore new skills. So you're operating outside of your comfort zone. And I'll give you an example. So as I started to grow the business more purposefully, I mean, my, my sweet spot on arena is training and coaching people. What is not my sweet spot is having sales calls with um, different law firms. And to start with, honestly, Jim, I used to feel like it was an interview I'd be literally even though I know I know a reasonable amount about training and coaching because I've done it for such a long time and I'm passionate about it and I had and and almost my ego was like oh I can't believe this I want to be good at this but I'm not but I sort of did it and did it until I realized that actually it's not sales at all it's just doing what you're always doing which is engaging with people seeing if you can help them and finding a workable solution and my I had to get out of my own head as to what it was that I thought I was doing. So going back to your original question, I think this development piece with lawyers is all about, they almost don't want to expose themselves to not being quite as good at a certain thing, whether it be, you know, some lawyers who it might be brilliant at the sort of statute or the appendix or the, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then when it comes to, would you like to give a talk to uh, the Law Society of Scotland on that? And think, oh my, no, because that's not, no, it's not what I do. There's, a, there's an equation, isn't there, Jim, I think, anyway. Doing first, then comes the confidence. It's never, I'll wait till I'm confident, then I'll do. It's always that way round. And how I've progressed in all the various things that I've done, um, you know, some of it budget and scarfer, some of it's worked brilliantly, whatever, is I allow myself, for the most part, I sometimes talk about it, but to go through that journey of not being that good at it and feeling you know it hits the ego a bit God, I want to be good at this I'm not that good at that and so I think that's that's the biggest one that I see so just on that I've got a question because I've noted yeah, down that what you're saying is you've got to put your ego aside <laughs> to some degree and I think for all of us at all times it's good yeah. to try and crush our egos as much as possible and um, that's true but the other bit that you said there that um, I'm, I'm really interested about and just want to ask you a little bit about is um, that word sales right <laughs> because like you um, working in the legal 
profession, I've definitely picked up on a sense that sales is a bit of a word that, I don't know, it just has a bit of a connotation for whatever reason. And whether you call it business development or marketing or, or whatever, but it's in sales. And of course, the blunt truth is we're all buying, we're all selling all the time. And effectively, we're all really in sales. When you think about it, you spoke earlier about the billable hour, which of course, for some firms is the key driver in their firm. What would you say to those people, uh, including me, uh, maybe including you too, from what you said, about, about wrestling with the idea that I'm in sales and I've, <laughs> I've got to go out there and I have to sell. I can, rem- I can remember the crystallising moment for me of how I improved at sales. And it was this. Someone said to me, do you like being sold to? I was like, oh, God, no. No. Right? And I would say that's most lawyers. If you ask most lawyers, do you like being sold to? Unless if you said to my husband, you know, do you like being sold the next Porsche or whatever? I'm sure, or, you know, most of us don't like being sold to. So then I thought to myself, right, well, if I don't like being sold to, presumably most other people don't either. So stop selling. So now I don't sell at all. I just help, you know. And you you talked about my social media, how that came about really is because as the pandemic locked us all down, I couldn't put on my you know, dress in high heels and go visit people. So I had to switch my mindset into, well, you can't do that. So what can you do? So I learned a little bit about social media. I'm certainly no expert at it at all. But it was a way to try and make my presence felt in a way I wasn't able to do. And that of itself is sort of selling, but it's not really. I'm, what I try and do is put posts out that people might find valuable interesting sometimes thought-provoking things that have come up as a result of working with some of our clients certain issues that have come up that how what how are we wrestling with it what are we doing um you know and and for me that's been quite useful and, and that engages people and it feels less like sales because it just feels like you're able in an environment where, where we, over the last two years we haven't seen each other as much to be able to connect with people what you said there uh, i stopped thinking about it as sales and just sort of viewing it as helping yeah uh what what a what a great way to look at it what a great lens to look at it through so uh so that's probably a nice and useful segue for me to say thank you for a fantastic conversation this afternoon you're welcome so thank you nadine stanton and congratulations on winning the ceo (laughs) award was it ceo of the the year 2022 Yeah, thank you very much. Very well deserved. So uh, thank you. Look forward to seeing you very soon.